My grandpa has been going through a lot lately. After grandma passed away, he kind of went a little mushy. We were asked to come and get him one night after he was found wandering near his house, and the police suggested that we might want to have someone keep an eye on him. Since I was just sitting around the house and doing nothing with my life, my parents extended the idea that this might give me a little freedom since I had recently been chafing under my father's rules. They gave me rules, of course, like no using my grandfather's house for wild parties, no sneaking girls in at all hours of the night, and my grandfather's safety would always come first. If we get another call about him wandering off, he'll be off to a nursing home, and you will be moving back home. So I moved my things in with Grandpa, and we became roommates. Grandpa was a pretty good roommate, all things considered. I lived upstairs in the loft. Grandpa had a loft-style house with a whole other dwelling upstairs, and he lived it downstairs since it was hard for him to get up and down the stairs. I did most of the cooking and the cleaning. Grandpa bought the groceries and the beer, though that was our little secret, and we lived in harmony for most days. The only thing that annoyed me was all the stories. Don't get me wrong, Grandpa had a lot of good stories. He had been in the Gulf War and he had driven trucks in Alaska on treacherous roads, and he had spent almost all of his life in the Appalachian Mountains. In fact, this house had been his childhood home. He had many stories about camping, exploring, and roaming the woods around the property. Those I didn't mind so much. There were many nights that Grandpa and I would sit on the porch with a case of beer, and he would tell me stories of exploring the woods and discovering its majesty. It was the lies that he would tell sometimes. He made some pretty outlandish claims about the woods that I just couldn't shake off. He claimed to have met a Sasquatch running for his life as it chased him from its part of the woods. He had seen forest spirits and spent a month in their camp as time moved differently there. He had met animal people, spoken with pale, moonlight guardians that lived underground, and many other things. It wasn't just drunken tales either, those I could have forgiven, but he would ambush you sometimes with these strange little stories. You'd be washing dishes or cleaning the living room or brushing your teeth, and suddenly, he would be right behind you with some tall tale. I mostly rolled my eyes at these stories, but last night, he had told me something truly ridiculous. My best friend Ren turned into a tree. I had choked a little on my beer and finally set it down. I was a little drunk and maybe shouldn't have been so frustrated, but these stories were becoming a bit much. I had heard all manner of stories from Grandpa and just sort of shrugged them off, or politely listened to them. But this one was so bizarre that it took me by surprise. His friend had turned into a tree. What the heck did he mean? Your friend had turned into a tree, I challenged. Grandpa nodded and took another swig of beer. How, Grandpa? Tell me how a person turns into a tree. He looked thoughtful. It's kind of a long story. Are you sure you have time for it? I was off the next day, and I nodded. Yeah, I would say that I have time for it. He finished his beer and threw the bottle into the woods, hearing it break against a nearby tree. This was a habit that he had kept from my childhood, and no one seemed to be able to break him of it. The funny thing was that, despite him smashing the bottles, I never found any glass in the woods around his house. I always assumed that Grandma had cleaned it up, but I had continued to find no glass with Grandma gone. Just one of life's little mysteries, I told myself. And so, Grandpa began his odd tale. When I was about nine, a new boy moved into the valley. His name was Renurde, but I always just called him Ren. His family was from the Bayou, Louisiana, 
and he wasn't sure of how things were in the Appalachians. But still, I was glad for a new playmate since our closest neighbor was about five miles in either direction, and we played in the hills and forests around our homes. Ren liked to find bugs and small spiders, and put them in a jar so that he could study them. Ren fancied himself something of a scientist, and the Appalachian Forest offered him much to explore. Now, the woods were always open to me. Mama never told us that we couldn't explore. But Grandma warned me never to go into the southern grove without her. It was beautiful there. The forest old and different somehow from the rest of the sprawling valley. I would ask her why I couldn't explore here alone. And she would say that... It was dangerous if you didn't know what to touch, and what to leave well enough alone. Like this, she had said, pointing at a thick, almost honey-like sap that was oozing from a nearby tree. That is the sap of the old calabash tree. You must never touch it, for if you do, not even I can help you. I had asked her why, and she had said that her grandma had told it to her and hers had told it to her. It's just one of these rules that we follow. One of those rules we don't question. Ren was inquisitive. He wanted to explore everything, and he noticed that we were avoiding that particular stretch of forest. I had told him some stories about the place when we had first met, that there were two-headed beetles that lived there about the strange flowers and technicolor patterns, and the large trees that my grandmother had always called calabashes. He asked me to take him there, not really feeling comfortable exploring the woods alone yet. He was never far from my side when we were in the woods, and he asked me specifically one afternoon if we could go out there. We were young, ten at the most, and it didn't take much convincing. I had tried to remain steadfast, not wanting anything to happen since. I never went there without Grandma, but he finally broke me down. I agreed to take him, but I said that he had to do what I said. Don't touch nothing, I told him, especially if I say so. He promised he wouldn't, and we had set off for the grove. We stopped at his house before setting out, and he came back with a backpack that clinked a little as he walked. I had little doubt that it was full of specimen jars and other such things. He may not have intended to touch, but he definitely intended to study. And so we made our way to the grove, and as soon as he saw the oddly colored flowers, he was in love. The grove is a special place, you see. Things there are closer to nature than anywhere else. And Grandma always said it was easier to feel the old world in places like the grove. Made a connection to the earth. A connection to magic. And the people who spend a lot of time there can sometimes hear the voices of the forest that others have forgotten. When Grandma read Robert Frost... She thought that maybe he had found some sort of grove of his own. We spent an hour just exploring the grove. Ren looked at the beetles, putting one in a jar so that he could study it later, and sketching some of the plants as he made notes. I showed him the calabash tree, that massive white gold giant, and I saw the wonder in his eyes that were there every time he found a bug or a leaf that he didn't recognize. He approached it, and I understood his need to touch it. I myself had needed to touch it the first time. I had really understood what I was seeing. It's the size of it, you see. Your mind tells you that nothing that big can possibly be real. But once you touch it, you know it must exist. It wasn't until I saw him take out his knife that I realized his intent. I ran for it. Telling him not to, but he seemed mesmerized by the golden bark of the towering tree. He wanted some. That much was obvious. 
but Grandma had always made it very clear that you did not strip bark from the calabash tree. Rendon now. He probably assumed that a tree so large would have plenty of bark. He couldn't have known what lay beneath. As his knife slid easily into the soft bark of the calabash tree, a gold spurt of sap struck him full in the face. He stumbled back, the sap flowing as his knife quivered in the side of the massive trunk, and I saw him clutch his face and scream. I pulled him away from the tree, the roots threatening to trip him, and as his hands came down, I could see that his face was changing. His face was turning brown, his skin thickening, and the pigment of his eyes were beginning to film over as though he was blind. What's happening? Ren asked, his voice deepening as his throat stiffened. I didn't know, but I knew what I had to do. I left his bag on the ground, the jars slamming together angrily and pulled him onto my shoulders. We were about three miles into the woods, but Ren wasn't very heavy. He was small even for a ten-year-old, and I pulled him out of my back and carried him with very little effort. We ran, heading for my grandmother's house. Grandma would know what to do. She could save him. As I ran, I just knew that if I could get him there, that she would save him. We hadn't gone far when he started getting heavier. Like I said, he wasn't large, but I was only ten and ran and started getting heavy. The boy was light when we had left the grove, me walking as I balanced him on my back. But he became heavier and heavier as we walked. His arms hung uselessly at my sides, and his body became like a stone on my back. My legs started to shake as my progress was slowed to a crawl. When I was drawn up short, I thought maybe one of his feet had caught on something. I looked back and almost dropped him. His feet had elongated until it drug out behind me, and his toes were becoming long and searching. They were pushing their way down into the ground, and as I pulled, they attempted to root themselves in the dirt. I pulled him along, trying my best to get him to my grandmother, but eventually, I just couldn't take him any further. We were in a clearing, a stream trickling through that I knew would be a heavy lifting crossing with the winter flow. And I left him there, saying that I would go and get help. Ren called me back and asked me to stay with him. I told him that I couldn't do that. If I gave up, he would be stuck like this. My grandma knew about these sorts of things and she might be able to help him. I made all kinds of excuses, but in the end... I was just scared. This was so weird, so odd, and my ten-year-old brain didn't know what to do about it. He said please and asked me to stay, his voice cracking like a branch in a high wind. And after some hesitation, I sat and said I would. His arms and legs were now stiff and bark-like, and he cried at tears of yellow sap. I wanted to reach out and wipe them, but I remembered what that sap had done to him and resisted. His feet were growing, breaking the ground and sliding into the earth as they sought purchase. I asked how he was feeling and he said it was very strange. He said that as he grew, everything seemed to slow down to lengthen, and he was filled with an odd sense of eternity. He said that he felt ancient and brand new. He felt lonely yet, filled with the knowledge that he was never alone. He felt sad for the life he was leaving behind, and excited for the life that was beginning. The process took about 20 minutes from start to finish, and I sat with him as he changed, not wanting him to go through this alone. His skin thickened, and taking on a wooden cast, as his legs descended into the earth, his chest expanded, Ren growing as his bones and his body grew, and his small arms were thrust upwards as he reached for the sky. His face and body sort of grew into one, 
becoming his trunk, and his eyes began to sink into his newly formed trunk. Much too soon, he was a tree, and I was left to sitting beside a half-grown sapling with a pair of expressive rings on its trunk. I sat there, mouth agape, as Grandpa finished his story. What happened after that, surely no one believed that Rat had turned into a tree. Grandpa shook his head. Only one person. My family and his spent the night searching the woods with the search party from town. They thought that something had happened to my brain and made up something to cope with it. They could see that I was shaken by whatever had happened. And they still wanted to find Ren and make sure that he was okay. I tried to tell them, tried to explain what had happened. But my grandma appeared at that moment and wrapped an arm around me. She told them that she would watch me while the town surged and took me into her house for cocoa. Over cocoa and cookies, she told me that she had tried to warn me about the grove. She said it was a tragedy, what had happened. But that was the way of the world sometimes. He took a last pull of his beer and launched it into the woods. She said that life was cruel sometimes, but that there was an order. Ren had tried to go against that order and he broke the rules, and that cruelty took its revenge. She reminded me that I must never go against that order, not if I wanted to live amongst nature. I thought about this before shaking my head and telling him that I didn't believe it. People don't just turn into trees, Grandpa. He gave me a strange look and walked into the house. I thought that was the end of the story, but that would be too easy for Grandpa. He woke me up the next morning about three hours before I wanted to be up and asked if I wanted to meet Ren. It took my fuzzy brain a few moments to realize what he was talking about before I remembered the story and asked if he meant the tree. Yes, would you like to meet him? I sighed. I didn't have anything going on that day, so I agreed. We walked into the woods, Grandpa ambling along, and hiked for about an hour in the crisp morning air. For a man in his 70s, Grandpa moved with an odd grace through the familiar woods of his childhood. I supposed he always had, but it was more pronounced now that he was so old. The squirrels and birds were just starting to get noisy, and I could hear the sounds of the forest as we walked. The wind in the trees, the soft noises of small animals in the brush, as they avoided the louder sounds of people. The sigh of the leaves as they pushed and pulled towards their inevitable decay. Having come here often to see my grandparents, I too had become aware of these sounds of tempers on the Appalachian forest. My cousins and I had often found it beautiful and mysterious, but it could also be fickle and temperamental. Just ask my cousin Jeremy who had twisted his ankle in a hole, only to find that hole was the home of a rattlesnake. If I could ask him since he had died while we were getting help. Grandpa led us to a clearing. A small stream bubbling beside it with fresh snow run. And I could see a large golden bar tree growing not too far from that river. It was towering, probably 15 feet tall. And as I approached, Grandpa shot a hand out and pointed down. I had nearly stepped into a small stream of honey-colored sap. That was trickling away from the tree and making its way towards the river. Don't want two calabash growing so close together, Grandpa chuckled. He greeted the tree as we approached and came around to its front to touch its trunk. The tree didn't move, didn't speak, but as I came up, I could see a swirl pattern on the front that looked like two huge eyes. The eyes seemed to follow you wherever you move, though, which was a little unsettling. Though unsettling, the tree looked no different from any other, except for the color and the weird sap. It wasn't until the wind picked up through the branches, shaking the leaves and making them dance, that I thought I heard a creaky old voice say, Hello, Harold, in response to my grandpa's greeting. We spent some time there, just talking that day. 
It seems I have a lot to learn from Grandpa's old stories.